Hello everyone, welcome back to Nuclear Engineering Lectures and to our Nuclear Waste Lecture Series. Today we are going to discuss options to dispose of nuclear waste in space. Wrong again, nuclear noggin, that's strike two. Ugh. And here's strike three. There's the heater right down the center. For what it's worth, no nuclear engineer is seriously considering space disposal of nuclear waste. There are plenty of other safe and more cost-effective options for terrestrial disposal. We don't need to toss our nuclear waste into space like we're Captain Planet or something. The general consensus among nuclear engineers is that there are plenty of more cost-effective and safe methods for disposing of nuclear waste terrestrially. And that's actually what I thought before making this video. However, after I did the math, I found something that surprised me, and I think that may surprise you as well. So let's dive in. Now, even though nuclear waste space disposal sounds a little bit absurd on the surface, scientists have seriously considered it in the past. In fact, NASA conducted a fairly comprehensive study in 1978 on the potential of space nuclear waste disposal. I provided a link to this study in the video description, and I recommend reading through the full study if you are interested, because it is absolutely fascinating. But for now, let's skip to the results of the study and try to understand the advantages and disadvantages of launching our waste into space. This NASA study explored five main approaches for disposing of waste in space. First, they considered placing the waste into high Earth orbit and letting it orbit the Earth indefinitely. Second, they considered placing the waste in orbit around the Moon. Third, they considered storing the waste on the Moon. Fourth, they considered placing the waste in orbit around the Sun at a radius of about 0.86 AU. And lastly, they considered solar system escape, or launching the waste fully beyond our solar system's gravity well. NASA found each of these options to be viable, and they each have their own advantages and disadvantages according to the metrics that NASA examined. Probably the most important aspect of each disposal method is how much energy that method requires, as higher energy requirements mean greater costs. For example, launching something into high Earth orbit requires significantly more energy than launching that same thing into low Earth orbit. This energy or impulse required for space missions is often measured using the term delta V, which represents the amount of velocity a rocket would need to gain to put the waste where it needs to be. As one may expect, launching the waste out of the solar system requires the greatest delta V, just under 9 kilometers per second, while the other options each required about the same delta V, about 4 kilometers per second. This means that four of these options require about the same amount of energy and are about equal in cost. I should note that launching our waste into the sun, which is what most people think of when they think of space nuclear waste disposal, is actually not the best option. Solar disposal requires much more energy than the other options, with a delta V of about 24 kilometers per second. Despite what you may think, launching an object into the sun is actually quite difficult. Rockets leaving the Earth have the same orbital momentum around the sun as the Earth, which is just under 30 kilometers per second. So shooting an object into the sun requires removing much of this orbital momentum, otherwise the object will just slingshot around the sun. As a result, it requires about 10 times less energy to shoot an object completely outside of the solar system than it takes to shoot that object into the sun. Isn't space fun? I know, I too am surprised that some of the science in Captain Planet does not hold up. Other than delta V, other factors to consider when choosing your space disposal method of choice include orbital stability, the container lifetime, and retrievability. Orbits tend to decay over time due to gravity perturbations, and some methods rely on the waste maintaining a stable, long-term orbit. In contrast, other methods are more permanent because they do not rely on the waste maintaining a stable orbit. Some of the options allow us to retrieve the waste, which we might need to do, for example, if we decide to reprocess it at some point in the future, while other options do not allow us to retrieve the waste, and once it's gone, it's gone. Furthermore, the options that do allow us to retrieve the waste must anticipate the lifetime of the containers, since we don't want nuclear waste leaking out in high Earth orbit. Okay, so we have five good options for disposing of nuclear waste in space. So how much would it cost, and would these options be safe? Again, we have about 88,000 metric tons of nuclear waste to dispose of, and the space shuttle carries about 27,000 kilograms of payload to low Earth orbit per launch. 
Sending an object to high Earth orbit or to the moon requires about five times as much energy as sending it to low Earth orbit. So I'll assume that we have about one-fifth of the payload to send these objects to high Earth orbit. Also, these launches cannot just carry pure nuclear waste. They also need to allocate space and weight for radiation shielding to protect the astronauts from the waste's radioactive decay, and for thermal control to make sure that the waste stays at a safe temperature throughout the launch. These missions also need to allocate payload for ejection and re-entry protection. About 2% of all rocket launches fail, which usually means the rocket explodes. And because we don't want to aerosolize a bunch of nuclear waste over the ocean if a launch fails, NASA devised plans to encase the waste in a re-entry structure that would fall back to Earth safely in the event of a launch failure without releasing any radioactivity to the environment. This structure would probably be made of niobium, which is relatively light, and has a high melting point, about 2,468 degrees Celsius. This structure would also be surrounded by silicide coating, making it impervious to oxidation as it fell through the atmosphere at a high temperature. So if our launches enclose the waste in this kind of re-entry structure, then the launches should not disperse any radioactivity even if a launch fails, which means that space nuclear waste disposal can be done safely. The downside to a re-entry safety structure, along with radiation shielding and limiting the payload for thermal considerations, is that all these things require quite a bit of weight, which means that you can fit less nuclear waste on each launch. In fact, incorporating all these features reduces the amount of waste that each launch can carry to only about 15% of the payload. These factors, combined with the extra energy required to send the waste from low Earth orbit to high Earth orbit, means that each space shuttle launch could only carry about 825 kilograms of waste, which means that we would need a whopping 106,000 space shuttle launches to dispose of our nuclear waste. Historically, each space shuttle launch has cost about $1.5 billion, which means that our plan for nuclear waste space disposal would cost a mere $120 trillion. These numbers are all approximate, but in any case, it is clear that our plan for space disposal of nuclear waste is way too expensive. Or is it? This math assumes that our fuel is not reprocessed at all, and that includes a bunch of extra stuff, namely unfissioned uranium and non-radioactive zirconium fuel cladding that encases our fission products and our fuel. The 1978 NASA study very astutely recognized that we do not need to dispose of fertile uranium or fuel clad, which contains almost no radiotoxicity, and that reprocessing the fuel and only disposing of the leftover radioactive fission products and long-lived heavy actinides was a far better plan. In fact, the NASA study considered nine classes, or mixes, of waste, each subjected to different degrees of reprocessing. Each degree removed more and more potentially useful radioisotopes until only the most difficult elements remained. Some mixes removed the fertile and fissile isotopes, some removed the shorter-lived, mildly radioactive isotopes, like zirconium and niobium, some removed the volatile elements, mixture 9 pretty much only contains technetium, and so forth. So let's assume that we have mixture 2 waste, which has undergone the minimum amount of reprocessing, meaning that it has only removed the leftover unfissioned uranium and fuel cladding. This minimal level of reprocessing nonetheless makes a huge difference, as it reduces the volume of our waste by about a factor of 40. So now, our plan only requires 2,700 launches, and has a price tag of about only $4 trillion. So it's still not really feasible and still too expensive, but our plan has become much more feasible. However, there is one surprising and interesting development that the math from this 1978 study does not consider. That development is SpaceX. The SpaceX Falcon Heavy rockets carry significantly more payload than the Space Shuttle did, about 2.5 times as much, and each Falcon Heavy launch costs significantly less than each Space Shuttle launch did. Combined, these factors mean that placing the same mass of nuclear waste into orbit using Falcon Heavy rockets costs about 1 36th as much as it would using the Space Shuttle. Altogether, this means that using Falcon Heavy rockets to dispose of our nuclear waste would only require $111 billion, which is a price tag that's starting to become feasible. 
What's more, using the target numbers for SpaceX's planned super heavy Starship launch vehicle brings the cost down even more to approximately $49 billion. This is approximately the same balance in the nuclear waste fund, which means that space disposal of nuclear waste may actually be feasible. And these numbers are still fairly conservative. We could reduce the mass of the waste even more if we removed some of the fissile actinide isotopes, which could be used to produce energy in fast reactors, and also if we move some of the isotopes that have modestly short half-lives. As I said before, these numbers assume that only about 15% of each payload is nuclear waste, and that the rest of the payload is shielding for astronauts, heat removal structures, safety structures for re-entry, and so forth. There may be potential to carry even more waste in every launch. For example, the payload that's used for radiation shielding to protect the astronauts from the radioactive decay of the nuclear waste may not be necessary if we can pilot these rockets remotely. So there still is potential to make space disposal of nuclear waste even more economic. This really surprised me when I started researching material for this video. I completely assumed that space disposal would be absurdly expensive, and I was very surprised to see that things like SpaceX are potentially making it more feasible. I even had to rewrite the script several times as I uncovered more and more potential to make space disposal more economic. So given this surprising data and the emergence of modern, more economic space launch options, maybe we should actually consider disposing of nuclear waste in space, and maybe we should contract SpaceX to solve our nuclear waste problems. Oh god, I'm shilling for Elon Musk now. What have I come to? Wait a minute. Elon Musk is the richest person in the world, and this channel needs some more sponsorship. Okay, Elon, if you're watching this video, please feel free to sponsor this channel so that we can solve this nuclear waste problem together. I mean, after all, my channel's grand total of zero dollars in ad revenue technically means that this channel is more profitable than Twitter. <laughs> This about completes our journey into the final frontier, which is space nuclear waste disposal. Space disposal is fun to think about, and it is actually much, much more cost effective than I thought before I did the research for this video. However, space disposal nonetheless poses risk of distributing radioisotopes if your launch fails and your rocket explodes, although a re-entry safety structure can help to mitigate this risk. But in my opinion, this risk really is not that necessary given the safety and relative cost effectiveness of options like geological disposal and reprocessing. Still, space disposal is surprisingly plausible and is very fun to consider. In the next video, we will consider one final option for disposing of nuclear waste, which more or less is what we're doing right now. Nothing. As it turns out, doing nothing about nuclear waste is a surprisingly effective approach. But we'll talk about that more next time. Thanks again for watching this video, and tune in next time for much ado about nothing. Okay, so I know this video is over, but let's loop back to answer a question that might be silly, but I'm sure that some people are asking. Would shooting our nuclear waste into the sun blow up the sun? Short answer is no, shooting our nuclear waste into the sun would not blow up the sun. Fissioning all of the fissionable isotopes in all of our spent nuclear fuel at the same time would release about 1.7 million megawatts of energy. This is certainly a lot of energy, about 34,000 times as much energy as released by the Tsar bomb, but it is still minuscule compared to the amount of energy that the sun releases every second, about 90 billion megatons of energy. Solar flares can release about 10 billion megatons of energy, which is an, an enormous amount of energy, and our spent fuel's 1.7 million megawatts of energy places it around the weaker classes of solar flares, about as much energy as an A-class solar flare. So you heard it here, and you can sleep soundly tonight. Launching our nuclear waste into the sun would not blow up the sun.